Evening everybody, thank you for coming along. Um, as Will said, we'll be discussing digital marketing for small business. Um, there's a lot to get through, so obviously we can't cover everything. Any questions you may have, we'll have an in-depth Q&A at the end. And even after that, if you've got any personal questions about your own website or things you might want to try, just grab one of us after and we can talk you through. So, digital marketing. Start off some stats. It's been estimated that 5.9 billion euros uh, will be spent online by Irish consumers this year alone. And that's just going to get bigger. By 2020, that's going to get towards 12.7. So we're talking big money. Uh, the thing about digital is changing. 85% uh, of Irish uh, adults now have access to a device they can use on the go. Um, and smartphone penetration now stands at 64%, with tablet usage doubling in the past 12 months to 40%. And uh, in terms of advertising spend, one euro in every three is now spent on mobile advertising. So if mobile is something you're not currently using in your strategy or haven't thought about using, it's something that you really need to pay attention to because that's just an area that is growing um, and you need to give it your attention. Uh, at Trinity 7, we believe there's a big opportunity for us businesses that aren't currently uh, using online properly. 60% uh, uh, of money spent online in Ireland is currently being spent on buying products outside of Ireland. So it's all going abroad, really, the majority of it. And 47,000 uh, Irish businesses do not currently have a website. So there's a big gap in the market, and there's still time for you guys to get ahead of competition and make a good, strong impact. So uh, actually, we'll do a quick straw. Who has a website at the moment here tonight? Around. And who's actually doing any kind of digital activity, any kind of advertising, marketing? Okay, so it's only a few. Great. So you have a website. The question is, how visible is it? Okay. If you're not employing any kind of digital marketing, uh, the chances are you're somewhere here in the middle of nowhere. Visitors cannot find you. They don't even know where you are. They don't even know you exist, more than likely. If you employ a good strategic approach to digital marketing, you should be able to prepare yourself to the equivalent of Grafton Street, where there's heavy footfall and a really serious uh, potential to do a uh, good, strong online business. And it's not necessarily a tricky or expensive thing to do if done well. Now, strategy could be a presentation all in itself, but really, you know, if you approach digital like any other business strategy, you need to carefully craft it, okay? You can't just be straight out of the box, off the shelf, okay? Uh, it would require a different analysis to understand your particular market, Okay, each business has a different market, different customers, uh, different problems. So you'd need to do some analysis, something like a SWOT analysis to work out what the strengths are in your business, what your weaknesses are, what your opportunities are, and probably most importantly, the threats to your business. Um, then from a digital point of view, you really want to benchmark yourself against your competitors. Are you visible? If you are, how, are you, how, how well ranked are you? And how are your main competitors ranked? Once you get that information, you're going to understand a bit more about your marketplace, and then you can actually set some realistic goals. Okay? Those goals then will dictate the strategy you want to employ, and then you can hopefully start making some progress. Tonight, we want to cover five, as much as possible these five main areas. Uh, these would be your main uh, digital marketing tools, SEO, paid advertising, social media, email marketing, and website analytics. Now, you might have all these tools at your disposal, but using the right tool for the right job is just as important. We're coming up to Christmas now, and that can be very time sensitive for a lot of companies. SEO takes a lot of time to, uh, to plan and actually deploy. So if you're starting uh, some digital marketing now and you need that Christmas traffic, SEO is not going to work. Okay, it's not enough time to get the, the, the action you need. So something like paid advertising, whether that's Google AdWords, Facebook advertising, that's more likely going to be the right tool for your job. Okay? You can get a campaign up and running as early as tomorrow. You can start showing your ads, start advertising your products or services straight away. You can start getting people coming to your website. That's highly targeted traffic that you should be able to convert if you do it well. On the other hand, you might have a good existing customer database and you've got a new product you want to sell them. Okay, so the typical do you want fries with that? The best way to uh, deploy that would be email marketing. You might have an email marketing database at your disposal. So if you push the right sales message, upselling your offer to them, you should be able to get traction quite quickly. So it's engine optimization. Briefly, essentially, it's the process of affecting the visibility of a website or a web page in a search engine's natural or, un or unpaid organic search results. Okay, now 
SEO is nothing if you don't understand what people are searching for. Okay, it's the cornerstone. Knowing, knowing what your customers are searching for is the cornerstone of SEO. Okay, um, a lot of people have this perception they know their business inside out, therefore they know what their customers are searching for. More often than not, people are missing a large portion of their potential target audience by making that assumption. Okay, so keyword research extremely important. Luckily, it's very straightforward. Okay, starts off with brainstorming. As a business owner or a marketing manager, which many of you probably are, you, like I say, you would have a good idea of most of the searches people would perform to find your products or services. But what we'd really advise you to do is to leverage other people around you. So you might have uh, colleagues in the office, you might have suppliers, distributors, all of these guys would actually have a different viewpoint, okay? And you'll actually find keywords you've never thought of. Uh, you can even survey customers, okay? Customers are effectively other people trying to reach. There's nothing stopping you putting a short survey together and actually asking them what do they search for? What is uh, the most important search term in their eyes? All this information is really valuable. If you dump all this into an Excel spreadsheet, uh, your next tool to use is the Google Keyword Planner tool. Okay, free tool, and what it allows you to do is drop in keywords, and it will return a long list of highly relevant uh, keywords associated to the initial keyword you gave it. Okay, now you can target this by country, so if you're not just looking for Irish uh, search results, uh, you can do this for UK, anywhere. Um, but what it will do is it will give you monthly traffic estimations, so you get an idea of how often something has been searched for, and it will give you an order priority, because um, you may have 15 keywords in your eyes that are the ideal keyword. But once you get this traffic information, you can start prioritizing. Well, this keyword is by far the most traffic generating keyword. That probably is our priority. Once you've, um, well, actually, it's just a quick tip here. If you're having issues uh, thinking of keywords, Google itself is actually a great place to get some inspiration. Uh, Google suggests, literally, you've probably seen it yourself, as you start typing, it will start telling you uh, ideas. Okay, so start typing bathroom, it starts trying to. Uh, lead us in a few directions, okay? Suites, ideas, tiles, accessories. As you continue to type, so we start with a B, it will then give us various options, beginning with B or T here. If you also perform a keyword search, at the very bottom of the page, you'll see searches related to whatever it is you search for. And again, this can be a very good idea for generating ideas, not only to optimize your website, but maybe content ideas for content generation. Once you've uh, worked out which keywords you want to use, the next step is to apply them to your website. Okay, so website optimization. Now, there's a number of areas in which keywords are important to apply on a web page, uh, starting with the meta title and description. Now, these are the two elements that show in the search results themselves. The meta title uh, has an SEO impact on your website, the description does not, but the description is effectively your sales copy to entice somebody to click through. Okay, so in the search results, if you have a compelling, enticing uh, description, you can act actually uh, take more clicks even if you don't rank number one. So if you're ranking number three and you've got a more compelling uh, description, you can actually get more clicks than who is ranking number one. So it's worthwhile putting time into that. So as we can see here, Homer, he's interested in chocolate donuts. So an appropriate title for our chocolate donuts page would be chocolate donuts from Mary's Bakery. What we've done is we've put our primary keyword in the title and it's at the beginning, which is important. And we're actually using it throughout the description. So the main keyword and associated keywords, okay? So learn the three secrets to Mary's award-winning uh, chocolate donuts, get times and locations for availability and learn how to make your own donuts at home. That should be a compelling reason for somebody to click if they've searched chocolate donuts, okay? The URL of the page itself should ideally contain keywords, and ideally the primary keyword. So if we have a page on chocolate donuts, and that is our primary keyword, let's call it chocolate-donuts. There are other areas that we want to pay attention to. So the headline of the page itself, that, if that's an article, that would be the article title. If it's a category listing, it will be the category name. If we can, we want to employ uh, one of our keywords in that title. Ideally, from a code point of view, that would be a H1 header tag and that tells Google this is the main heading. Uh, if you have subheadings throughout an article, you want to use H2, H3 uh, heading tags. Again, that tells Google these are the breakpoints within, uh, within this document, and this is the main keywords to be paying attention to. The body text, so that's the main content of the page. Um, when writing content, you have to keep keywords in mind, but you're not writing for keywords, okay? You need to write for the user. If you don't write for the user, you can end up writing something that doesn't make sense. And you see it time and again, um, a piece of content is just filled with content, uh, it's filled with keywords. 
every other word is chocolate donuts. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't read right. You're not going to engage a user. You're not going to get somebody to take necessarily action you want them to take. So always write for the user first and then review and see if you can, if it makes sense, introduce keywords. That would be your primary keywords and secondary keywords. But to be perfectly honest, if, if you can't make them fit logically, you're better off leaving them out. Okay, content speaks for itself. We've already discussed the URL. Images. Images are important and often underlooked, uh, overlooked. Um, image should be named appropriately. So again, a picture of our chocolate donut should be called chocolatedonuts.jpg. And adding alternate text enables uh, good usability for example, people who are hard of, um, who have issues with, uh, who have site issues. Uh, this will actually tell them what the picture is about. So the alternate text for the chocolate donut page, uh, picture should be chocolate donut with frosting, something like that. Linking internally within your website and to external websites, keywords are important. Uh, research has shown that if you link out to relevant and highly authoritative websites, that can actually give you an SEO bonus. So it's not always a case of keeping all the value in your web, in, into your website. If you want to reference something that's worthwhile, do so. Um, but linking internally is important because from a user point of view, you really want your content to be accessible from any page within three or four clicks. And by interlinking documents, you're going to enable that. Okay? The thing you want to avoid is using the standard click here, more info as the actual anchor text, the, the click text. Um, by using uh, meaningful keywords, you can actually tell not only the user, but the search engine what they're going to go to. So, a, a link that says more info does not tell me what I'm going to visit. Am I going to visit another recipe page? Am I going to visit about us page? So if you're taking them from the chocolate donut page to a raspberry donut recipe page, it should say raspberry donut recipe. Okay, that's the, that's the anchor text for the link. That's really important. Finally, meta keywords. You may have heard about this and you may think it's important, but to be perfectly honest, meta keywords has no uh, importance whatsoever in terms of SEO. Um, it, it, it's defunct for a long time. In fact, if you still employ the meta keywords tag with a list of keywords, all you're doing is you're tipping off your competition, what you're trying to uh, rank your page for. Okay, so uh, best practice is not to have that anymore. It just makes no sense. So there's more advanced ways of optimizing content. Um, usually you'd need a web developer for this, but there's a way of employing, uh, employing uh, advanced rich snippets and markup schema. So what that is effectively is code that surrounds certain content on your website. Um, Google has a list of different schema and rich snippets um, which apply to different pieces of content. Uh, so if we have reviews on a website, we can tag this up so that Google understands this is a review and it will pull that information to the search result, okay, which is really, really powerful. So it knows we have seven reviews on our page. It knows the average rating is 4.5 and it will show the star rating. Visually very good, draws the eye. It also is a recipe, this page, and because we've marked it up correctly, Google knows that this recipe takes one hour. Okay, so it actually pulls that information there. You can also put calorie information for recipes, and it can sometimes show calorie information. So again, additional information makes your search result that, that much more interesting, more likely to get a click. By uh, taking up imagery correctly as well, you can pull an image out. So this search result listing is much more appealing than a bog standard two-liner, okay? You can get more clicks with that. The next thing to consider is how you treat Google itself. If you don't treat Google properly, you're not gonna have a great SEO or online experience, okay? So Google sends out lots of what they call crawler, bots, spiders to crawl your website and index it. And if you don't do this correctly, you can run into problems. Good example is this. Homer lives in Springfield, which of course is in America, and he's still trying to buy donuts. But he's decided he's going to learn French, and he wants to buy his donuts from France. So Homer has managed to get to my French version of my website. Okay? Now, as a retailer, I don't want Homer to see my French donuts because those prices are in euro, and it's actually cheaper for him to buy euro than it is in dollars. So what I want to do is go, no, Homer, you're from America. You have to view my American website. So it's quite easy for me to put a redirect in that says, you're from this IP address from the USA. Go back to the USA. Now, that makes sense for me as a retailer. But what you're actually doing is you're applying the same logic to Google. Google crawls from America. 
So what this means in practice is when Google tries to visit my French version of my website, I'm telling it, no, you can't visit it. You have to go back to America and look at the American website because you're from America. And m many, many, many online retailers fall into this trap when they try to do international websites. So what you'd end up doing is Google would be denied access to any international version of your website and it'd only be able to see the American version, which means you'll never get those other websites indexed, you'll never get any orga organic traffic. So treating Google properly can actually be tricky, but if you, if you deploy uh, SEO properly, you can manage this situation better. A great, uh, a great website these days needs to be shared socially. Um, so social metrics have a big impact on SEO rankings and will continue to do so. This is easy to achieve with most websites. There's lots of plugins you can get that do the like, tweet, uh, Google+. But really, it's how you treat the information you send when you click share or like or tweet. Twitter, this simple looking post actually contains six key bits of information. Publisher, title, author, image, summary link. All these key bits of information um, if sent correctly, can make a nice uh, message that you want to uh, deploy when shared and tweeted. Uh, if it's done incorrectly, you might end up with a very different result. So it's important you send the right information depending on the social network. Now, the problem is there's a lot of social networks, a lot of different ways that's handled. So there's a number of tools you can use to validate and debug this process. But if you get that set up correctly, you can make sure when somebody does share something, it looks the way you want it to look. Uh, just as an extra note, Images are treated very differently depending on the platform. You know, Twitter in itself has different image sizes it uses, and Facebook does as well. So again, making sure you provide the right type of image to the platform can make a difference from a user perspective. Having a responsive, multi-device ready website is imperative. You, we, we covered the stats at the beginning. It's, uh, Mobile devices are increasing dramatically in their usage for accessing the web. If you don't have a website that's truly responsive, you're going to be running into issues. Okay? You're pretty much going to be alienating a big portion of your uh, traffic. So what do we mean by responsive? A website traditionally has its key blocks laid out like this on a desktop. But as the dimensions get smaller for your viewing area, you need these blocks to automatically uh, need these, these blocks to automatically respond and move around to show the content properly, okay, all the way down to a phone. So I don't know if any of you have had the horrible experience of going to a website and you have to pinch to zoom in and zoom out. Usability-wise, it's atrocious. If you, want to, if you expect somebody to buy but using a mobile device and that's a user experience, they're not going to do that. So having a website that's what they call fat finger friendly is important, okay? Some big fat fingers, sausage fingers should be able to still do what they need to do. Click on buttons, move around the website. Finally, in terms of your SEO and your content, your website content needs to be uniquely valuable. Okay? The Book of Kells, very unique, very valuable, and it attracts over 500,000 visitors a year. Okay? Your website needs to do the same. And this is obviously very tricky, and it's what makes SEO difficult. But the content you produce, if you can come at it from a, how can I make this content useful, how can I make this content engaging, how can I make this content worthwhile, you'll be you'll be on the right track to making something that is going to naturally be linked to, shared, talked about. If all you're doing is ripping off other people's content, just reposting other people's posts, you're not adding anything new to the internet. Okay? You're not going to be rewarded. So Google is moving in this direction, and if you don't start creating content with this in mind, you, ultimately you're going to be left behind. The second aspect to SEO would be the off-page elements, which is known as link building. Effectively, the process of getting third-party websites to reference yours. Uh, the logic being those links back to your website are counted as votes. And if you get links back from authoritative and trustworthy websites, some of that authority and trust passes back to your website. And that is what increases your value and trust, which in turn will raise your rankings. Um, so link building is a must. The best website in the world without any inbound links. A, it's probably never going to be found by Google unless you manually submit it to Google, but it will never have enough authority under its own right to rank well, okay? So, a number of different tactics you can employ. Uh, generating links from business directories, through blog commenting, press release and article syndication, guest posting, sponsorship and charity links, content marketing. There are many more, but these would be some of the more common ones. Keyword link building is balance. You don't want to have a link building campaign that just focuses on building a thousand directory links or just as blog commenting because that's not natural. Google is all about natural. The whole point of SEO is to actually 
effectively bend the rules of what Google set in place. Google want everything to be natural and organic. If you go out your way to generate links manually, you're kind of breaking the rules in a sense, but the whole point of doing it properly is that it looks natural, okay? So link building needs to be balanced. Okay, no harm in using all these different tactics, but use them in moderation. And the key thing with link building, if you've ever employed anybody to build links, you'll probably have 10,000 directory submissions for, for a fiver. You know, quality does not beat quantity. Um, sorry, quantity does not beat quality. <laughs> quality always wins, okay? There's always someone who will do it cheaper. There's always someone who will give you more for less. It doesn't work, okay? Link building is hard for a reason. It used to be very easy. It's getting harder because Google is making it harder. Google wants you to do it properly. So directories, kind of not the best uh, place to go looking for links, but if you go for local relative links, uh, relevant directories, you can find some worthwhile ones. So there's nothing wrong with the local chamber of commerce getting a link on that. That makes sense for your business if you're based in Ashburn or Meath. Okay? If Ashburn itself has a local directory, again, that, that's relevant to you. That can add some value. What you want to avoid is where you see this, 2,000 submissions to directories for $70. It's never going to be good. It's always going to be spam. It's always going to be junk. If you take part in this, you will be penalized sooner or later. Things to look out for when you are looking um, at directories. If you, if you see directories charging for you to remove links from their own directory, that's a strong indication that people have obviously got a directory link from them and then have had some reason to go back and say, can you take it away? Probably because they've had a penalty or ban imposed on them. And this is not a good place to get a link. So if you see someone charging to actually remove a link from the directory you want to submit to, don't submit to it. Um, if you're looking for an appropriate listing for your business, say I'm a bakery, I'm looking under the appropriate category, but I see mechanics and dog walkers and all sorts of things in the same category I'm trying to list myself in, it means that it's not moderated properly. The, all they want to do as the directory is take your money and just accept whatever you put up there. That means it's going to be abused. Again, not a great place. And again, if you see any links to spam, so Viagra, all sorts of horrible things, it exists, you see it all the time. If you see anything that you think is just not right, just avoid that directory. Blog commenting can be very useful um, if used correctly. For example, go with Cake and Energy again. I've gone to another baker's website, great recipe. It's, it's more than appropriate for me to leave a blog comment saying, great recipe, use it, cakes turned out great. And then I could actually link to my own recipe. And have, I actually did this uh, recipe the other night. It was really good, why not check it out? That makes sense, it's appropriate. What you see there is blogs that have nothing, uh, comments on blogs that have nothing to do with the content themselves. This was just lifted from a blog, hundreds and hundreds of blog comments. You know, iPhone case has been linked to there, next one free games online, and then some sort of form of drug you can buy online. You know, the comments make no sense and they're linking to random rubbish, okay? You don't want to be part of this. You'll actually get yourself banned, very, very bad. Buying links is a common practice, and big brands do it. Interflora last year actually got themselves banned by Google for buying links. They uh, did what were called advertorials with some of the big UK newspapers, uh, effectively advertisements masquerading as editorial pieces, promoting the product and linking back. Um, and they also effectively bribed a whole load of bloggers by sending lots of gifts and asking for links in return. Because they did this en masse, Google picked up on it and said, no, 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 that's buying links. You can't, you can't pretend it's not just by trying to make it look like something else. So they banned them. Now, what they had to do is undo all of that work, which probably cost them a lot of money, and eventually got the, the, the ban lifted. Sure. Oh, grand, sorry. Is that better? Is that better? Grand. Um, Content, this is where you want to be, okay? This is going to be your long-term strategy for building any success in terms of link building, okay? Uh, creating content that makes sense, that is worthwhile, that is digestible, that helps somebody solve a problem. That is your key motive, okay? Now, the real trick is to combine these three elements together. You want to create a really good piece of content, okay, at the right time and publish it at the right place, okay? If you can manage to combine those three, you can get some really good results. Back in 2012, um, I was doing some work for an accountancy firm in Dublin, and the budget was coming up. Now, it's a big budget, austerity was hitting, we knew people wanted to know what the hell was gonna be going on, how does this affect me, okay? So the why was there, okay? The content made sense. The time was there, because of the timing of the budget. 
So what we did is we planned to make two infographics to highlight uh, for each day six key points for how people be affected. And uh, whilst this was being planned, we then got in contact with lots of uh, newsworthy sources, uh, high value websites saying, look, this is what we're planning to do. Would you be interested in taking this content when we've done it? And linking back to the website. And as a result, um, this got published on the irishtimes.com website, the journal.ie, and uh, the net result was over the two days after the budget, they got one and a half months worth of traffic, organic traffic, just within a period of two days. So normally the last two months they got an average 1,100 visits, they got 1,700 within two days. They got a load of highly valuable authoritative links back to the website, which improved their own value, but they got a lot of referral traffic. So that's the true win-win scenario. If you can see ahead and kind of predict what's going to make sense in terms of content and actually place it at the right time and then make the approach to the right places to try and get it published, that's where you're going to make your impact. Now, that's challenging depending on your industry, but that is, that's the holy grail. SEO is obviously a much more longer term strategy. Uh, Google AdWords, paid advertising, gives you a much more instant hit in terms of traffic and sales. Uh, one of the key issues with AdWords is it's not set up correctly. Okay, uh, it's easy to use, but if you don't uh, deploy it properly, you can have issues. This is what a well set up uh, Google AdWords account looks like. It would comprise of one or more ad campaigns um, within itself, would have multiple ad groups, and those ad groups contain a short defined list of relevant keywords which have relevant ads which point to relevant landing pages. Okay, the key thing being here, everything is related to one another. The last thing you want to do is create an ad group that has a big long list of keywords um, on varying subjects. Okay, so if I'm selling white goods, there's no point in me creating my ad group called general and dropping keywords for washing machines, refrigerators, dishwashers, because they're all different products. Okay, they're too loosely tied together. Okay. Now, the reason which you have multiple ad campaigns is because your ad campaign is your, your, essentially your command center. Okay? This allows you to control uh, daily budgets, where you uh, show your ads to the location, um, what language you show them to, the different networks you display to. So we have the ability with each campaign to select what time of day and what day of the week our ads show. Very, very important if we have a business that say relies on uh, business at night. So I'm a 24 hour locksmith. I need, I know I get a lot of calls in the evening. So I want to make sure my ads show over the nighttime period. Okay. So that if somebody does get locked out at three o'clock in the morning, when they go looking on Google, bang, I'm there. Uh, if you have an international campaign and you're running an ad, uh, an ad campaign in say America, you want to make sure that you're showing, you know, your adverts during American business hours, not Irish business hours. Okay, so this is highly customizable and you can do this on the ad campaign level, which means you can have multiple campaigns doing different things. Okay, at the same time, you can select where you want these ads to show. So there's two ways of doing this. You can drop a pin on the map and go, I want to show my ads within a fixed radius. So what we've done is we've highlighted Ashburn and said we want to show our ads within five kilometers of Ashburn. So anybody searching for our keywords within this uh, circle here, the ads will show. Anybody outside, it won't. Um, the other way of doing this is you can just select postcode, county, city, country, and you can build up your, your target areas that way. And you can actually combine the two. So very powerful. In the UK especially, you can just do it by postcode, which is a very, very finite group of, uh, a finite area. Okay? Once you've got your campaign set up, a lot of people forget to connect it to analytics. Okay? Google Analytics is the free bit of software, which we'll talk about later, which tells you all the information um, and how people use your website. Okay? By connecting AdWords and Analytics together, Analytics will take all of the uh, click information, all of the, uh, the costing information, and that can be reviewed later. And you can actually also pull some analytical information back into AdWords itself. So within AdWords, you can see bounce rate, page views, time on page, things like that to help you use AdWords more effectively. Now, keywords. Again, one of the, key, uh, one of the main issues um, when people set up campaigns. Uh, most people just drop all their keywords in and just think, right, that's it, it's set up, it will go. I've told Google what I want to show ads for, and it will just do it. What they don't realize is by just dropping in the keyword as it is, okay, that's what's called a broad match keyword. Okay? So hopefully you can see here, I know it's a bit fuzzy, uh, this, this keyword here just says Samsonite four wheel bags. So what we're telling Google is, I want to show my ad when somebody searches for that search. What you're actually telling Google is, 
I want Google to show the ads when somebody searches for that and whatever Google deems is relevant to that. So Google, Google's motive is obviously to show results, but it's also to take your money when it comes to AdWords. So Google will use what it thinks is appropriate. Okay, so if somebody searches for Antler four-wheel bags, it will show the ad. If someone searches for Samsonite wheeled suit carriers, it will show the ad. The problem is, if I don't sell suit carriers, and somebody searches for that and clicks on my ad, I've wasted money. Okay? So the next match type is called the modified broad match. And by placing a plus in front of uh, any of the keywords, and you can do this on multiple keywords within the search term, you tell Google, I need this particular keyword to be still part of the search, and you can kind of use your own uh, logic to work out what else is relevant. So by putting plus Samsonite four-wheel bags, it would match Samsonite two-wheel baggage, okay, or luggage, but it wouldn't match something where maybe previous example, Antler for wheel bags, because Samsung doesn't exist in that search, it won't show. So you can lock down the search by putting this plus in front of keywords. Okay, so you get the benefit of letting Google use its logic while still locking it down. The next match type is called phrase match. By putting double quotes around the phrase, you're telling Google this phrase must exist in the search. Okay, you can put this must exist. So. Uh, Samsonite four-wheel bags, red Samsonite four-wheel bags would, would show the ad, but you can't flip the order around, so Samsonite red four-wheel bags wouldn't work. Okay? And finally, the exact match, by putting square brackets around your search term, you tell Google categorically, only show for this search. Don't mess with it, only this search. So employing a mixture of these is going to give you the best results from a campaign. Okay? It takes a bit of time, it takes a bit of practice, but you can't get a campaign working particularly effectively with all of one type. There's multiple different um, display network networks with uh, AdWords. This is the search network you'd be most familiar with, so basically the Google search tool. When you type in your search, you get a number of ads. Typically, you get three at the top. They now highlight that with the little orange, yellowy ad box, and then you get seven down the side. Sometimes there's two at the top and eight down the side, but that's where all ads are. All of this here is free organic stuff. So. If I've got my campaign set up correctly and I've searched for conveyancing solicitors, my ad shows. Now, what makes a good advert? Okay, A good advert is relevant to what's searched for. So I've searched for conveyancing solicitor and my main keyword is actually part of the main headline title, conveyancing solicitors. I'm also using my keyword within the ad copy in part. Okay, So established in 1873, conveyancing law firm Dublin. Dublin. Uh, convincing is in a search term, so that gets bolded there. Convincing solicitor is, so that gets bolded there. It draws attention. Um, I'm also using the full range of ad extensions. A lot of people don't deploy ad extensions. It allows you to get an advantage over other people. So, for example, we have the call extension here, and that will display your phone number. If you're on a mobile device, it'll allow you to uh, click to call functionality. So all you do on mobile is you click on that number, it allows you to ring straight away. Very useful. We have the location extension, shows the address, click on that, takes you to Google Maps. You can plot directions to the business, again, very useful. We then have uh, site links, so you're allowed to show four additional links to different pages on your website. So we've got full service law firm, meet our team, legal news, fees guarantee. So if you're selling a product, you might want to show relevant products there that are not exactly the same, but might, people might buy. If you're showing um, a category for something, you might show uh, relevant categories or you might just want to kind of show uh, important uh, information about the company. So meet the team, uh, sales offers, about us, anything you choose. You can play with this and see how people react. And finally, we have the new one called Call Out Extensions. And this is a three 25 character length, uh, effectively, it's like a features and benefit list, okay? There's no link, but you can essentially list benefits and, benefits and features of your company, your product, your service. So fees agreed in advance, no hidden costs, written fees estimate. Plenty of examples of having a bad advert. Uh, this kind of covers two examples. I've searched for orders to order Domino's online, and I've got an advert from Pizza Hut. Okay, now that in itself might not be a bad thing, but what they've done is they've dynamically inserted whatever you search for into the title of their ad. So I've, I've searched for order Domino's online, the title says order Domino's online. Unfortunately, <clears throat> people can be quite stupid, okay? And people do not read the ad in its, in its entirety sometimes. They just see what's bolded, they click. So if I wanted my Domino's pizza, I see I can order it from there, I click, land on Pizza Hut, I don't want Pizza Hut, I click back. That's cost me money. Now, people do like to sometimes advertise against competitors, um, but it would be much more compelling advert to say, 
why not try Pizza Hut? Or want Domino's, why not have Pizza Hut? It's a better pizza, something like that. You're telling them that you're not Domino's, you're trying to uh, effectively um, transfer them to your brand, okay? So it's just a bad advert, it's gonna waste money, that happens all the time. The display network is the other network, and this allows you to uh, show an array of different uh, adverts from uh, text, images, video, animations. Um, the display network is comprised of hundreds of thousands of websites that uh, have opted in to show Google advertising banners. So you can see here, uh, Mail Online, Ooh. you can see here the Mail Online, uh, this banner here is actually a Google advert, effectively, okay? Uh, big brands use them, small brands use them. You can get your brand on well-known websites quite cheaply and easily. Um, YouTube is another good example of the display network. Um, you can run uh, an array of different ads on YouTube. Um, you can have the uh, skippable overlay, uh, the skippable ads that run at the beginning. You get five seconds and then you can skip if you wish. Uh, you can have the non-skippable ads that you have to watch the entire ad before you can watch the video. Uh, you have the overlay ads here, which click on the banner, takes you to the website, or you can close it with the cross. Uh, and then you have the usual display marketing ads on the right-hand side. Um, remarketing is, uh, is an advanced tool that can be used across both search and display. Very, very powerful. Unfortunately, you can't really go into too much detail on it, but effectively what you can do is on your website, you can create a marketing list of people that visit your website but do not carry out a certain action. So I want people to come to my web. I'm Black Knight. I want somebody to come to my website and either buy a domain or buy some hosting. Okay? If I come to the, uh, the Black Knight website and go and look at domains and don't buy it and leave, I can add myself, uh, I can be added to what's called a, a marketing list, okay? And we might call that the domain marketing list. When I then go off and look elsewhere online and I hit a website that offers display marketing for uh, display advertising for Google, I can then be shown an ad going, hey, you're looking for domains, we offer them. So again, Black Knight are following me around the internet saying uh, we still have domains for sale for this price. Alternatively, I'd have gone to the hosting part of their website, I could be added into the hosting list. So when I go around the internet, it actually tries to push me hosting. So depending on your, on your products and services, you can actually have lots of different marketing lists and push them the specific product they're looking at, not just a generic, remember our brand, come back to us. You can push them the exact sales message. So very powerful, um, very useful. The key takeaway from AdWords though, is hands-on management is a must, okay? People set up good campaigns, people get good campaigns set up by other people and then they let them run. They will run well, but in time, they will cost you money, your return investment will, will, will go, okay? Um, there's a number of tools that you can use, um, really powerful tools and easy to use. So the first one will be called the search term report. What that does is that gives you uh, a breakdown of all of the searches that generated your ads to be shown, okay? And then the ones that were clicked. So you can quick, quick, quickly see uh, search, uh, search terms that generated ad impressions that should never have done so, okay? So for example, you forgot to um, add what are called negative keywords to your campaigns, okay? Which are the same as normal keywords, but a negative keyword would be, I don't want my ad to show when this is searched for and that is searched for. So if I sell furniture, I don't want somebody to see an ad when they search for cheap furniture. I sell high quality furniture. I don't want somebody to see an ad when they search for secondhand furniture or anything that says secondhand or nasty or those sorts of keywords, okay? So that report will tell you if that's happening, you can add them to negative keywords. Um, Managing keywords themselves very important. If you see poor performing keywords within that group, that can actually drag down the overall performance of the ad group entirely. So pausing poor performing keywords um, would be recommended. Um, testing ads would be very important as well. Each ad group should run multiple ads um, at the same time. Let them all compete against themselves. Over time, you'll see which one gets the best clicks, maybe the best conversions. Pause the poor performing ads rewrite your best performing ad, okay? Give it a slightly different twist, let them run, and you see which one of those performs well, okay? So that, that process of constantly testing and improving will actually improve your conversion and your return on investment. The same can be said for landing pages. If a landing page isn't very effective, test, change things, you'll see what works better. Email marketing. Um, Quite a simple uh, yet overlooked aspect of marketing. Um, all starts with your marketing list. A lot of people don't uh, get email addresses legally. 
Um, you actually have to get people to opt in through email marketing. You can't just, um, if they send you a, uh, an inquiry through your website, just go grand. They've inquired for a service. I'm going to start pushing their marketing material, okay? You need to get them to opt in to receive correspondence for you, um, for marketing. Um, a lot of people try the opt out approach whereby they're automatically opted in. You're not actually allowed to do that. So make sure that you're doing that properly. You don't want um, to be reported for uh, sending spam. Um, once you've got your marketing uh, list together, you can actually segment this. This is uh, the powerful way of doing email marketing. If you've got an inquiry from your furniture products on your website, um, somebody filled in a contact form and wanted to be uh, informed of marketing promotions, you can maybe add them to your furniture marketing <coughs> list. If somebody was on electronics, the electronics part of your website, you can add them to your electronics marketing list. If you segment your list into the different areas you know people are interested in, you don't have to just send them all the same message. Okay? You can actually tailor your message to your different marketing lists. And that's where the power comes in. So the basic principle is, first of all, you define the campaign. Okay? So Christmas marketing newsletter, uh, November 2014, and the title will be uh, Dining Room Furniture Sale. Okay? Make sure you give your campaigns a name, make sure they're easily recognizable, so you can tell straight away, right, I sent that then, and it was about this. Okay? Any decent marketing software, email marketing software, will allow you to test the email once it's created. Emails are sent to not only multiple devices, but are read with multiple browsers. The last thing you need is somebody to open your email on an iPhone and it doesn't render properly, images are broken or the layouts are broken. Um, as, you, you know, as you know, there's lots of different phones, iPhone, Samsung, um, not, and then you've got all the different tablets and you've got all the different browsers, Internet Explorer, Firefox, uh, Safari. Um, any decent piece of software allowed to test all this and just make sure it all looks proper. Okay? You don't want to waste time creating a, uh, an email, uh, email shot and it, it doesn't look properly. Once you get ready to send, over time you'll start working out when are the best days, uh, days of the week and best times of day to send uh, a newsletter. Um, Fridays and Mondays usually aren't best. People winding down for the weekend or just coming back after the weekend. People don't necessarily pay attention to 20 emails in their inbox and yours is one of them on a Monday morning. It just gets put in the bin. Um, but you'll, you'll know that over time. You can share to that to go at the appropriate time. Um, your software should uh, allow you to measure uh, how your, your marketing campaign went, so who opened, who added to the spam list, who requested to be removed. Make sure you action all these things. So if you, if you, if you get somebody who wants to be taken off the list, take them off the list. Somebody marks you a spam, take them off the list. Um, <coughs> but it's important to know the open rates, who clicks on the link to the website. You can start working out, okay, well, this image got clicked a lot, that image didn't, okay? You can start seeing that information. And then if you've got analytics on your website, you can also gather all that information into a proper report and then next time you do an email campaign, you can work out um, how people interact, not only with the, with the email message you sent them, but then where you sent them on the website. So maybe you need to send them to different landing pages, maybe you need to do different imagery, make things bigger, smaller, etc. So this will be a good example of an email marketing shot. It's quite obvious what we're doing. We're, we're promoting, saving up to 72%. It's for 12 hours only, on 12 items only. The call to action is very clear. Buy, shop now. These 12 items all click through to different parts of the website um, with the view of them buying. So this would be easily uh, analyzable. You can work out maybe to change different colors, different font sizes, uh, different products. You'll see some of these were clicked on more than others, so you know certain imagery works and doesn't work. Social media, obviously a big part of um, digital marketing. Uh, everything is becoming more and more social, more and more different social networks. Um, but the kind of the key ones obviously are YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+. Um, Facebook, probably the biggest of them all. It's the third uh, most popular site in Ireland. It's, pop it's popular. The great thing about Facebook is popular against a, a broad range of people, so different demographics, and you can use that to your advantage when doing advertising and marketing and promoting. So depending on your product or service, it, you know, it offers you a large opportunity to engage with that customer base. Facebook advertising itself, um, it's, 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 a, it's a novel in itself. There's so many different options you can do now. It used to be very simple, just basically get people to like your, po uh, your page more. Um, but now we can do lots of different things. A lot of people miss this when they, when they put anything up on Facebook, okay? Get them to your website. A lot of people just put content up. Great imagery, great this, great that. People engage, they comment, they share, they like. But most of the time, it doesn't link back to the website. 
your website is your key piece of real estate, really. Um, some people have shops on Facebook, some people have apps on Facebook, but what you want to do is draw them to the website, okay? So make sure there's a call to action, make sure there's a way in which it's clear. If I click on this, I'm gonna to go to something that I don't wanna read, I want to buy, I want to see more of. Um, people don't push people to the website enough. So different advertising, um, when you set up a campaign, you can do lots of different things. So send people to your website, obviously it's one of them. Uh, promote conversions on your website. So what that would do is it would make you install uh, uh, a little uh, GIF uh, for tracking. So you'd install that on your website, a little pixel um, on the page that is your thank you page or your conversion page. So if it's buying something, it will be the thank you for your order page. You'd put that um, pixel on that page. Facebook knows that conversion has happened and that's what it will report back to you. So you can get some return on investment. Um, it might just be filling in the contact form, you'd have that pixel installed on the thank you page of the contact form. So um, you, can, you can make Google tell you whether you're converting well or not. Uh, you can obviously boost your posts, so if you've got a post you know works well and you want to keep on pushing that message, you can put some budget behind that and make that seen by more people. Promoting your page would probably be the first thing for any Facebook owner, uh, business owner to do. Um, getting a big audience to begin with helps with anything you pu uh, publish and promote. Um, again, people who, who have the apps, um, you can push obviously the installation and engagement of your app. Um, events like this, you know, you can run a promotion to say that this event is running to make sure you get a good turnout. I mean, this is just going to grow this list. It's getting more and more um, bespoke and the options behind that are endless. So, I mean, unfortunately that's kind of a presentation in itself. Uh, Good thing about Facebook is it does a good job of giving you information back. So Facebook Insights is like Google Analytics. It's your information center of what people have been doing. Okay, so you can see in terms of page likes, where you're at, whether you're increasing, and over what period of time. You can see post reach. So if you're boosting posts, you can see how that's impacting on the engagement as well. So Facebook Insights is quite deep. Um, you get a lot of this kind of fancy stuff um, as, as a dashboard, but there's lots of information behind that you should really dig down into because that's going to tell you what type of image to put in your post next time, what type of message you should put in your post. Like any of these things, you know, certain things work, certain things don't. Um, unfortunately, it's stupid things like pictures of cats and stuff like that isn't always appropriate for business, but you can work out what is appropriate for your business as well as the lighthearted stuff. That does work. There's no harm in kind of mixing it up. Twitter. Um, Obviously, you know, very simply, you can uh, get your message across in 140 characters or less. Predominantly, big brands use it predominantly for customer service. I mean, you can obviously do promoted tweets. They're doing buying through Twitter now. Um, but really, from a general but a business point of view, it's going to be customer service. It's great for customer service. People can get in contact very easily. You can respond very easily. Okay? You can't set up a Twitter channel and then ignore it because if you're getting feedback, negative feedback, and you're not responding, it's going to create a storm in itself. Uh, LinkedIn, predominantly a business network in, uh, aspect. You can have success with business to business uh, products and services through LinkedIn, um, but really it's about promoting and networking and building relationships, which can actually help in terms of SEO. It's a great relationship building platform. And then obviously there's Google Plus, Google's version of the social networking. Um, bit of a mixture between LinkedIn and Facebook. Realistically, you know, it, it, it's still quite niche in a way, but it's obviously got, it's got a massive customer base. Anybody with a Gmail account has Google+, whether they use it or not. Social is getting more and more integrated into SEO. This is Google's social platform. Use it. It's going to become more relevant. And they won't tell you, but it will. But, you know, people who have big circles, big connections, uh, big uh, groups of people sharing and interacting with the content on Google+, Plus will get better results in the future. Um, finally, reporting and analytics. Google Analytics is, is, is the key uh, for this, okay? Your website needs to have it installed. It's free, it's easy, get it installed. It gives you information that is invaluable. This is my organic traffic. It tells me for the last four years, it's been increasing and it's still increasing. That means I have no question if I need to, if I have any budget that needs to be spent, let's spend it on organic, okay? Um, you can get a full breakdown of all the different referral and kind of uh, source types. So Google Organic, my primary traffic source, um, tells me the performance of the site, 36% of people bounce from this traffic source and the page views time. I can also see Google AdWords here, cost per click. 
Okay, a lot of traffic, but it actually outperforms my organic traffic. So it's worthwhile. I'm getting more page views on average and similar time on site. So it's a very engaged source of traffic. And you get that for lots of different, you've got Facebook down there um, and various different things. You can see a lot of technical information. So from a mobile point of view, you know, Apple iPad and Apple iPhone are by far the biggest uh, visitors. And then a, hand, a various range of different Samsung heads, heads, uh, handsets. And then if you've got an e-commerce website, e-commerce tracking is invaluable. You can see by source where your turnover is. So you can see here, organic search has generated 1.2 million okay, in sales. So that's 45% of the share of my total revenue. I can see what other types of sources are bringing different. So pay search, it's only brought in 37 grand. Email is 167 grand. Okay, so my email marketing efforts are working. I should put more time into that. Okay. If you don't have a website where you're selling something, you can set up what's called goals and other conversions. So if you just have a website where you want somebody to get in contact, somebody filling contact form, that's a goal. Okay? Somebody who signs up to a newsletter, that's a goal. You can set up lots of different goals and you can start seeing what channels are generating the best res response, the best return. Uh, finally, it used to be very simple, or very, very simple, in terms of the end user to work out what was working. Okay, I can see analytics tells me this person came to my website through paid advertising and then bought my product. Great, paid advertising is where it's at, where it's at. What actually happens is usually somebody comes in contact with your website first through a different medium. Okay. So what you need to analyze, and this is in analytics, called assisted conversions. Okay? It's really important to look at this. Assisted conversions show the path people take before they take the ultimate uh, step, getting in contact, buying something. Okay? So instead of just seeing someone came directly to my website and bought, someone came directly to my website and bought, somebody came organically and bought, I can actually see they came originally through a display ad once, went off, a few days later they came back directly because they knew my brand because that's they, they'd been to the website already and bought. So I know display had an impact there. On this one, then this is these are real examples. You can say originally somebody came in display, they later came back organically, they later came back through display, they later, through a whole kind of ream of different ones here, eventually came in through direct and they bought. Okay? So you can see how your how your different channels are touching, okay, uh, users and visitors to your website. And again, finally, some came from display, left, later on came back through organic. So if you don't analyze your assisted conversions, you might actually be missing something that is actually uh, generating a lot of business for you. You might decide pay-per-click is not working, generates next to no actual business for me. It might be the primary source of that initial contact. Okay? Keyword tracking, once you know your keywords, get them in some sort of tool that automatically tracks for you. You don't want to be Googling every weekend, looking to see where you are and updating a spreadsheet. Okay? And if you do do that, log out of your Google account. Okay? If you're logged into a Google account and you search, you're going to see a, a, a different search result than, than everybody else does. Okay? If you keep on visiting a, set, a website regularly, it will actually push it up in the search results. Okay? So log out of your Google account. But use a free tool. There's a good one called Mars. Uh, there's loads of different ones. And basically over time, it will see whether your ranking is going up or down. Especially important if you see all of a sudden your traffic is wiped out or your traffic doubles overnight. You want to try and tie that back to a why. Okay? If you see your traffic is halved overnight and all of your searches through a particular search term have dropped off the face of the earth, then you know at least where the problem is. Okay? You might have had a penalty, it might be a problem with the website, it could be anything, but at least you know where to start looking. So uh, track your keywords. So really, final thoughts, you know, the future digital, it's unknown. I mean, we know certain ways it's going. Mobile is important. Social is very important. Okay? Um, it's a wealth of opportunity. Ireland is still an untapped resource. It's growing. There's money available to be had for businesses. No one should be afraid of it. Investment always, so almost results in return on some level. It just depends on how you deploy those tactics. Um, you know, it's a growing space. There's, there's, there's lots of... Uh, Changing, you know, people will gravitate to mobile, and that will change the way in which we market. I'm sure. Um, although the rules are changing, um, the, the core concepts remain the same. And touching back on SEO, it's about providing the best user experience. Google organically is very transparent. Through paid advertising, they're making money. It's less transparent. Organically, all I'd say is it's about providing the best result. That's all they want to do. So if you can provide good piece of content a great piece of 
video, anything like that, you're going to be winning. Any questions? Thank <laughs> you.